Good morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. As we are about to open again the words of Mrs. White, the words that God has left for this generation, let us ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and his direction so that we may more properly consider this that is now before us. Shall we seek his presence, ask for his wisdom, and wait for his blessing? Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we come before you on this Sabbath, recognizing the blessing that you have given us in a time to set aside the cares of this world. We also recognize, Father, our great need of you. We can do nothing without you. As we assemble again together, we accept gratefully your promise that where two or more are gathered, yet there you will be also. Help us, Father, that we may examine these warnings, these admonitions, these directions, that we may be able to look at these and discuss these. We ask, Father, for your spirit, for your Holy Spirit, For not only does your spirit convict us of sin, but it instructs us in righteousness. May we be so instructed. May we be prepared for that that you would have us to do. There are events before us, Father that we may not understand right now. We need your instruction and your guidance so that we may become as harmless as doves, but as wise as serpents to understand that which you would have us to do. May your angels attend us, each one, Direct us now. Be with us, please. May the words that are spoken be those of edification, of warning, and a blessing. So that we may be greater prepared for that that you would have us to do. This we ask, this we pray, and for this we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. I normally find it easier to go over things at least partially a second time to more clearly understand that which is being said. We're going to finish this document that we begun that we had begun about three weeks ago and touch on several other points from what we have been studying through the book of Zephaniah. All of this has been because of different passages that Mrs. White presented that had to do with the book of Zephaniah. Please understand that you are free to make comments. You are free to ask questions. You are free to offer input as we go through this study. Much of what is said here, much of what was written, can be very hard to take. Yet, it are, these are things that we must wrestle with. 
we must consider for the time in which we live. Christ declares that those who do his words <clears throat> are like a man who built his house upon a rock. This house, the tempest and flood could not sweep away. When we are to build, we are to build directly upon that foundation. Those who do not do Christ's words are like the man who built his house upon the sand. Storm and tempest beat upon that house and it fell. And great was the fall of it. It was an entire wreck. The result of professing to keep the law of God, yet walking contrary to the principles of that law, is seen in the wrecked house. Those who make a profession of failing to obey cannot stand the storm of temptation. What does this mean to you? What should this mean to all of us? We went through this this last week. We have now had a week to consider this. Those who make a profession while failing to obey cannot stand the storm of temptation. One act of disobedience weakens the power to see the sinfulness of the second act. One little disregard of a thus saith the Lord is sufficient to stop the promised blessing of the Holy Spirit. By disobedience, the light once so precious becomes obscure. Satan takes charge of mind and soul, and God is greatly dishonored. One little disregard of a thus saith the Lord was seen in the choice of Samson of a wife of the Philistines. That light, which was so precious, became obscured again <clears throat> by his choice to visit the harlot of Gaza, and then to progress to Delilah. If he be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land, but if he refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword. Isaiah 1, 19, 20. 19, 20 was the year after the 1919 Bible Conference. Had the church eaten of the good of the land, or had they chosen to be devoured by the sword after this conference? These words are true. Exact obedience is required. And those who say it is not possible to live a perfect life Throw upon God the imputation of injustice and untruth. How do you see this? What is your consideration of this statement? Let God be true and every man a liar. We have to take God at his word and believe that he can work through us to overcome sin if we just keep faithful to him. All right. <clears throat> Search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. John 5 39. A neglect to feed the hunger of the soul leaves it weak and strengthless, unable to do the will of God. The life of such a one is like a barren fig tree, destitute of fruit. Rely upon no human being for words of comfort. Seek the Lord most earnestly while you read his rich promises and apply them. Then you will not be consumers, but providers. We left off with this thought last week. 
How many of us have remained as consumers? How few of us are choosing to be providers? The indwelling savior is always revealed by the words. Consider carefully that statement. What does it mean to you? What does it show by your words? For are not your words also your actions? The Holy Spirit does not abide in the heart of man who is peevish if others do not grasp his ideas and plans, which appear to him to be the sum and substance of everything desirable. From the lips of such a man, there come scathing remarks, which grieve the Holy Spirit away and produce attributes which are satanic rather than divine. From the lips of those that choose to separate, to cast out, to remove that which they do not understand. are grieving the Holy Spirit away. How serious is that? How serious is the production of attributes which are satanic rather than divine? Here again, these are not my words. No, no. Who wrote this? Who provided this? The look, <clears throat> go ahead. Yeah, well, this is the spirit of prophecy. And um, of course, which is means the Holy Spirit has inspired these things. Now, I mean, we can all think of situations in which we have been impatient, um, frustrated, dealing with others. So, so we, you know, so we all recognize that we have done this. But the the question is, when we do this, how do we respond afterwards? Do we recognize what we have done, or do we justify it? And if we continue to justify it. This will just become part of our character. Did Samson, did Samson justify his choice of a wife of the Philistines? Oh, yeah. Did Samson, for in his own mind, justify his choice of the harlot of Gaza? Mm -hmm. Each of those steps made it easier for him to justify his time with Delilah, but also to justify his use of wine. Mm -hmm. So this gives a, a very direct example to exactly what you were just speaking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you are provoked, do not become impatient. And that's, you know, some people it's more difficult than others. Uh, it's easy for me, for the most part, because I'm slow to react to things. So, um, so I'm naturally patient, um, but it still happens. And so, you know, the question is, what kind of character do we have? What kind of character are we developing? And, and to me, the biggest thing would be here, the justification that we have for our actions. Because if we, if we excuse these things in ourselves, we will never develop a Christ-like character. The Lord would have those connected with his work speak at all times with the meekness of Christ. 
If you are provoked, do not become impatient. Manifest the gentleness of which Christ has given an example in his precious life. Christ took our nature that he might set us an example, showing those who receive him the fruit they must bear. What fruit do we bear? What fruit are we showing? Are we showing that of Christ or are we showing that of the adversary? The Lord requires those who serve him to show by word and action that they are sons and daughters of God, to show by the daily life that we are members of the royal family, children of the heavenly king, is of more value in God's sight than all the learning, all wisdom, and all high attainments. Any other course of action is dishonesty to the family of God and will certainly be divorced from it. You don't need a master of divinity. You don't need to become a doctor of arts, of divinity, or other things as far as God is concerned. These mean nothing to him. The attainments that man values are as dross to God. When a man is filled with the Holy Spirit, the more severely he is tested and tried, the more clearly he proves that he is a true representative of Christ in word, in spirit, and in action. Word, spirit, action. First angel, second angel, third angel. Christ declares, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. John 14, 12. What is the promise to every true believer? Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. Acts 1, 8. How many times must we hear from the corporate church and within the movement that we seek the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Yet how little do we recognize the spirit that has already been being poured out? How can we ask for the Holy Spirit's outpouring when we are not unified? When we are not together? When there are those that would seek to cast some out because they disagree with the way that they approach things. This is the break that's being applied upon this vehicle. This is what is stopping the work from going forward. Might we not better my brethren and sisters take ourselves to task for our unlikeness to Christ? He says, ye are my witnesses. What kind of witnesses are we for truth and righteousness? Are we striving with all of our God-given powers to reach the measure of the stature of men and women in Christ? Are we seeking for his fullness ever reaching higher and higher, trying to attain to the perfection of his character? How can you be a witness if you don't see what's going on? I've had to think on that many years. In the next couple of weeks, 
I may get together with some old friends. Over the last few weeks, there have been discussions about this coming time to assemble together. There was a person of this group years ago. Never, th this lady never really impressed me that much. Before our senior year, she received a letter telling her that she was not going to be welcomed back because it had been determined that her influence was not that type that was considered a good influence because she was found to have been smoking cigarettes. Now she thought that this was no great, no great deal to her, but her father got the letter. Her father called the conference and said, if my daughter is not good enough for your school, then I'm not good enough to be your contractor to build churches for you. Find someone else. And of course, the first letter was rescinded. This same person asked a question of the other women openly and directly for all to see. Would you feel comfortable staying in the women's dormitory if there was a transgender person, a person that was born a man but sought to be a woman and was being allowed to stay in the women's dormitory? Would you feel comfortable at that point, the response that she was given was, why don't we apply ourselves to see if a third dormitory could be constructed, one for transgenders and gays? How much further from the word of God how much further from the character of Christ do we need to walk? This bothers me. I don't see this as joking. I don't see this as frivolous. I see this as very sad because little do they wish to apply what is already written within the word. When God's servants reach this point, they will be sealed in their foreheads. What point is that? When we seek for his fullness, reaching higher and higher, trying to attain the perfection of character. How can we expect to be sealed in the foreheads if we will not attempt? to grow. If we're not willing to have the same character as Christ, will we be sealed? Will we be judged worthy? What do you think? The recording angel will declare it is done. Please pay attention. Ezekiel 9.11. They will be complete in him whose they are by creation and redemption. Now the, the scriptural reference there, is that added then by you? No. That was there? That was there. Okay, that's interesting. Because on the E.G. White uh, disc, I have the letters and manuscripts added, and it doesn't it doesn't add that. I didn't add that. Mm -hmm. Interesting. 
because because the verse itself so that ellen white must have added that or maybe someone else i don't know but on um the verse itself it's behold the man clothed in linen with the writing case that is played i'm reading a different translation here um uh behold the man clothed with linen which had the inkhorn by his side reported the matter saying i have done as thou hast commanded me now of course this is dealing with the sealing here and so this would be a reference to ezekiel 9 11 but it's it's you know paraphrased here it is done or i have done as thou hast commanded me right so it's interesting so yeah i just was wondering whether you had added that or when whenever i'm going through a document like this if there is something especially regarding a scripture reference that mm -hmm. is not being directly addressed i place it in brackets i also note that this is something <clears throat> added by the editor added by myself mm -hmm. no this was in the document in the document the source document as i found it okay and and where'd you find the source document what's the source then this is manuscript 148 yeah, 1899 paragraph 33. Right. So where did you find that source though? Is it uh I had gone on the online Ellen White. Okay. And it was one of three documents that I was led to okay. assemble together. Okay, so it would be in selected messages that they added this. Because selected messages quotes this. All right. Because because in the original letter and manuscript that I have, it doesn't have this. So if I go to selected messages, I should be able to find it, right? I don't know. I rarely will go to selected messages. Okay. Um. No, nope, they don't put it in selected messages either. So I'm just not sure why it's there. If I can't, I can't find it. But if you could find, you know, the link where you got this, then that would help me. Fine. Okay. Thanks. You bet. There is nothing in the natural world that has life, but what grows and produces fruit. And in the spiritual world, there is no life without growth and grace. Spiritual impulse is not growth. Impulse is feeling. And to depend on feeling is to be changeful as circumstances. The professed Christian who does not draw life from Christ's life is not a doer of the word. He is a paralyzed member only connected in name with the body. At times fitful, convulsive movements will be seen with no permanent activity. Let no one think that the grace of Christ inspires these short-lived impulsive actions. Many people are the subjects of impressions which are not reliable. Many have what they think are good impressions, wonderful exaltation of feeling, but the life does not represent an abiding Christ. They do not draw life from the source of all life. They are not drinking of the living water, which springs up into eternal life. God's grace is the living water of which we must drink. It quickens the whole being into spiritual life the life of the Son of God. Personal religion means perfect conforming to the life of Christ. Consider this for a moment. I thought perfection was impossible. Personal religion means perfect conforming to the life of Christ. 
When we possess this religion, we will show sound spiritual growth because we are partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Was Samson given a method? Was he given a way to have escaped the corruption that was all around him? Was Samson possessing a personal religion when he chose to marry a wife of the Philistines? or to go to Gaza, or to the Valley of Serek. Samson was fully relying upon himself and not upon Christ. He could have escaped the corruption that was then in the world through lust. He didn't have to be a partaker of this. He chose that he would be deceived. Advance is the watchword. There are no idlers in the Lord's vineyard. We must be laborers together, else we shall fail in the work of overcoming, and our religious influence will cause other souls to fail. How does that make you feel? What does that say to you? That if we fail in the work of overcoming, our religious influence would cause others to fail. We are to be an example. <clears throat> we are to represent Christ. We are to be his ambassadors at this time in our history. No soul is lost that does not draw other souls down with it. Misery loves company. No soul is lost that does not draw other souls down with it. Are you going to be one that draws souls down? Or are you going to be one that lifts them up? This is the choice that we are given today. Let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from all iniquity, that Christ may not be ashamed of us. How many today wish to be told that Christ is ashamed of you? How many times as children did we hear from our mothers and our fathers that they were ashamed of our actions? And how did you feel when that pronouncement was made? In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, <clears throat> I appeal to church members to arise and closely criticize themselves. Feel that this work is so important that you cannot engage in criticizing others. How powerful are those words today? How do you see this admonition? What is your thought about this statement?
Silence speaks volumes. Reveal an indwelling savior. Then you will understand what it means to be a true missionary. You will bring a Christ-like intensity into your work and many souls will be saved through your earnest prayers and interested labors. How can we be missionaries if we are more willing to criticize than to build up? The statement that she is giving here, feel that this work is so important that you cannot engage in criticizing others, is most powerful. Any thoughts about what we've just read? Well, so, you know, one of the problems that we, we always face as human beings is we we see problems in others, but not in ourselves. And we don't realize how destructive our attitudes about others is. Um, you know, the whole idea of criticizing others, I mean, and, and it's a difficult thing because we all recognize problems exist, whether it's with the church or with other people. Um, but the, the reason why do we why do we engage in that work of a critic and are we actually helping that person in any way are we helping the people that we're talking to or are we um, um, feeding a judgmental attitude about others a self-justifying attitude because often we criticize others um, to really compare ourselves with others, to feel better about ourselves. And the whole point of the gospel is to see that we are indeed sinners and that we need Christ. So some people believe that, you know, it's, it's in the criticism of those who are in error that our main work lies. But our main work lies in criticizing our own characters. And, and seeking to perfect a Christ-like character. If we don't have the character of Christ, then whose character do we have? Well, the character of the accuser. There are only two choices. There is not a third choice. There is not the ability to say, time will tell. God does not respect the heavenly fence sitter. Because either we are making our choice for Christ, or we are making our choice against him. What choice are we making today? And to add to that, when we, we think about why we criticize others, I mean, one is, of course, to justify our own actions because we're better than others. We want to, we can think that because we can recognize error in others, that somehow means that we don't have to address the error in ourselves. Because it's, it's, it's any, and I've said this many times, it's easy to find fault. It's easy to find fault with the church, with church members, uh, with people that we come in contact, because we all have things that we could, especially if we don't fully understand a situation, that we can see that are wrong. And... And we know that 
something's wrong, it needs to be corrected. But the problem is how we go about trying to correct error isn't really profitable. First, because it doesn't, we're not changed. So we don't have the power to change others. We can, we can engage in debate and, and paper writing and all this type of thing. But in the end, the question is, how are, how are we seeing ourselves in this whole scheme of things? And it, and it becomes a cloak. We can, we can be so active in finding faults in what others say, do, teach, um, that we can totally miss the whole point of, of what God wants to do in our lives. A comment that Mrs. White made along the same line. From letter 102 of 1886. The forces of the powers of darkness are mustering for the closing work of this earth's history. Oh, how earnest should we be to examine ourselves. We are in positive danger of losing our souls when we are criticizing others, remarking others' failures. We must examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves, know ye not, your own selves, how that Christ, Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates, 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Now we should think of our state before God. How carefully should we seek to obtain a knowledge of ourselves from the word of God? Where shall we stand in the future crisis that shall come? Where shall we stand in the crisis that shall come upon Nashville? Shall we stand as children of God at his right hand or as disobedient, unthankful, and, and unholy at his left hand? The unsearchable riches of Christ should engage our attention now. The honor that cometh from God is above every earthly honor. Our souls must be securely riveted to the rock of ages. There is much here yet to consider. <clears throat> we are given instruction and admonition. This task is not always easy. It is not easy to have it presented. It is not easy at times to accept. We have to decide. Do we want the character of Christ? Or do we wish the other character? Speaking of the time of Jeremiah, had they a proper sense of their disobedience, they would have acknowledged the justice of the Lord's course and recognized the authority of the prophet. God entreated them to repent that he might spare them humiliation and that a people called by his name should not become tributary to a heathen nation. But they scoffed at his counsel and went after false prophets. When we choose to criticize, as they criticize Jeremiah, are we not walking in the same path that the children of Israel did? Are we not seeing the same enslavement going on around us? The Lord then commanded Jeremiah to write letters to the captains, to the elders, to the priests, to the prophets, 
and all the people who had been taken as captives to Babylon, bidding them not to be deluded into believing their deliverance was nigh, but to quietly submit to their captors, quietly pursue their avocations, and make for themselves peaceful homes among the conquerors. Quietly, quietly, peacefully. He bade them not to allow their prophets or diviners to deceive them with false expectations. But the Lord assured them by the words of Jeremiah that after 70 years of bondage, they should be delivered and returned to Jerusalem. He would listen to their prayers <clears throat> and give them the favor when they returned to him with all their hearts. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity, and I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, saith the Lord, and I will bring you again into the place where I caused you to be carried away captive. Comment from the chat. First Corinthians, First Corinthians eleven thirty one. For if we should judge ourselves, we should not be judged. The time in which Jeremiah wrote this, the message that was given. The land had begun its Sabbaths. There were those that had been carried away. So are we talking that this would have occurred roughly at about 607 or after 607 BC? Chronologically, where would we place this with Jeremiah? For we know that there was more than one period of 70 years. We speak quite a bit about the periods of years from 742 BC to 723 and from 723 to 677. And chiastically, from 1798 to 1844, and then from 1844 to 1863. But where do we place the 70 years from 677 to 607? Is that part of that same line, or is it a different line altogether? Well, what do you mean a different line altogether? Well, <clears throat> just outlining the situation here. From 742 to 723 to 677 was the first portion of a line where we are able to tie this in with the seven times of Leviticus 26. And then we go on the other side from 1798 to 1844 to 1863. And we have that same structure, right? Mm -hmm. Yet from 677 to 607, we have a 70 year period. Mm -hmm. Does that 70 year period also occur in the second portion of this same line? Okay, so you're asking, is there a 70 years that precedes, because um, you have the 65 years and then you have 70 years, right? right? And you're saying, does that 70 years uh, occur uh, from 1798 to 1863 prior to that? 
what we have as a parallel is we have a hundred and well, 1260 years, which is, um, so we don't have a 70 years that I know of. But we have a 70 years that occurred after or between 677 when Manasseh was taken captive mm -hmm. and 607 when the children of the leadership of Jerusalem, Daniel and his friends, were taken captive, right? Yep. So, so that 70 years and the 70 years that follow are two periods of 70 years to make up 140 years, right? Correct. Okay. Now, what we have as a parallel at the end is the two periods of 1260 years. So we don't have 70 years um, preceding 1798, but we do have 1260 years. And we have another period of 1260 years as well. So that's, of course, the 2520 for Northern Israel, which kind of overlaps with that other period, but um, they would be part of a similar type of structure. So we know that the 1260 and the 70 years, Ellen White parallels those two of the period of the captivity and the second period of 1260 years, which is ableism. But from 677 to 607, yeah. we have a period of 70 years that show not only did the king no longer truly rule his land, that he'd become a vassal. Mm -hmm. By 607, the land was now being devoid of those that were the children the ones that would have proceeded to continue the line, the royal line of that house, right? Mm -hmm. So the nation and the church was by and large being taken down between 677 and 607. Yeah, well, that's the first seven times. So that's going to be the period that's um, given where the kingship is, is um, uh, broken, right? Okay. And, and there's a, a chance for reform. And Josiah is the reformer that comes first. It begins with Manasseh. Um, but anyway, this goes back to the idea, a line in and of itself, because that's more what I was trying to, to understand what you meant by that. Well, I mean, is it, is it something that's separate from what the, the time periods, the chronological periods of this line of, of the seven times? Well, it's part of the line of the seven times, but it, it, each of these, each of these, um, um, these reform lines that exist within the seven times, there's all kinds of reform lines, um, but they're all part of a structure. Um, so, so you do have a reform line dealing with, uh, you know, from Manasseh to Josiah. And then that's going to end with Daniel's captivity, you know, two years after the death of Josiah. And you also have a reform line for the 70 years Babylonian captivity in and of itself. But, of course, they're part of a bigger structure. So... I guess I was just looking at my history. Okay. Because as I'm seeing a, a nation or a government being removed from the world stage from 677 to 607, mm -hmm. we see a government coming upon the world stage 
because in 1793, the cornerstone of the U.S. Capitol was laid by George Washington. By 1863, the cornerstone of American independence was being tested by those that were opposed to giving up slavery and that chose to stand against Abraham Lincoln and that which he was presenting. So our first president laid a cornerstone, our 16th president in Lincoln defended that cornerstone. So I just I, I'm just having to consider whether those events of history could line up. And that's the reason behind my question. Hmm. Well, okay, so you're not looking for a period of 70 years preceding 1798. No, but I'm looking at a, at a period from 1793 to 1863 that could parallel 677 to 607. Okay, so you're gonna put a 70, okay, so. So you're gonna say in 1793, you're gonna put it 70 years there and try to parallel it with those 70 years. I'm just asking if the historical event would fit. Okay, I don't think I would do that. Okay. And, and the reason is because there's not a reason, there, there's no reason to put the structure there. Um, I mean, we can definitely find lots of different periods of 70 years and, and try to say that there's some significance, but um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't see that there's any precedent for doing it in this way. There's nothing about, I mean, obviously 1863 marks the end of the structure, but we don't have 70 years at the beginning like that. We have 65 years. So it's these five extra years that you just want to add to that 65 no. years backwards to 1793, saying that that's starting something. Right? No, I'm, well, I'm looking that this, this period of 65 years was already well covered. Yeah. I'm looking, is there a second witness to the validity of what we're, we're approaching here? Yeah. So you're saying that if we go to 1793, what's happening there could somehow connect to 1863. Correct. Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure if I, um, to me, it would just be kind of, I mean, there's so many different events um, that we could, we could look at uh, in the United States history that people just choose, right? So there's not, there's not a particular thing, you know, and maybe I'm just being overly, uh, analytical here but um but we do have lots of things that happened in 1793 and, and we had some structures that um were uh um you know addressing those points um i'm trying to think specifically um so you're saying in 1793, what's the event that you're using? Washington laid the cornerstone of the U.S. Capitol. Okay, so that's the like the Capitol building or of Washington, D.C. itself? I would say the Capitol building. Okay.
Yeah, there's just so much stuff happening in American history that you you know you could take. I don't know if the Capitol building itself would be a sufficient reason to to put those seventy years there. What is the Capitol building used for? Well, it houses the government, the uh, the the various forms of government there. Um, it houses the Senate and it houses and the, the House. Right. Yeah. So you got the two different parts of the American government that are housed there. Where the legislature meets. Yeah. And what is when the legislature speaks? What is that? The pronouncement of the legislature is the what? Be the rule of law. Okay, but is is that also not the speaking of the government speaking either as a lamb or as a dragon? Yeah, when it speaks as a dragon. I just don't know how that connects to 1863, other than, I mean, if you're going to deal with uh, the Adventist church and the end of that structure. I'm just saying there is 70 years between the two. I just don't know if it's having this event is sufficient to mark that 70 years as a prophetic period. Okay. You, you understand why I have the problem. No, I, I'm understanding the problem. I'm just presenting an idea. Yeah, yeah. And, and the reason, just to explain a little bit more. So, for instance, um, these types of things are done all the time by other Christians when it comes to events in Jewish history and connecting them, like ancient Jewish history, with modern Jewish history. Uh, they do this with 25, 20 years all the time. Um, so they find... And they'll calculate that 25, 20 years in different ways. Sometimes they'll do it as 360 days in a year. So it's going to be, you know, 25, 20 times 360 days rather than how we would normally do 365 and a quarter. Right. And, and they will mark it to get some event that they don't actually have a very specific date on, but they have a close enough date that they can sort of get these 25, 20 years um, worked out. But they're connecting things that aren't necessarily connected. I mean, they're all connected. Any, any event of the past is connected to event of the future, um, right? These all events are sort of connected, but they're not, they're not a sufficient structure. Um, and, and we saw this with uh, after 1844, when people just started picking different events to start the 2520, which is why, you know, uh, Uriah Smith eventually took the position that the 2520 was just from Leviticus 26 didn't exist, which was a really odd, actually, when you look at a lot of his other reasoning, it was a very odd um, thing for him to say. But, you know, so I just don't think we can we can do that. I think we have to be careful about how we do that so we're consistent. So when we have these structures... They need to be connected more directly. Um, you know, because you could take the lane of the cornerstone, you could take all different kinds of events and decide that they're significant and connect them with some other date and find, you know, it's 70 years. But it doesn't mean that that's a prophetic period. It might, maybe just symbolically you could look at it, but... Um, I don't think it. I don't think it really fits. But that's just that's just me being analytical and cautious. Okay. Standing against Jeremiah, there were two other false prophets, Ahab and Zedekiah, who prophesied lies in the name of the Lord. These men professed to be holy teachers, but their lives were corrupt, and they were slaves to the pleasures of sin. How much like Samson were Ahab and Zedekiah? The prophet of God had condemned the evil course of these men and warned them of danger. 
but instead of repenting and reforming, they were angry with the faithful reproof of their sins and sought to thwart his work by stirring up the people to disbelieve his words and to act contrary to the counsel of God in the manner of subjecting themselves to the king of Babylon. The Lord testified through Jeremiah that these false prophets should be delivered into the hands of the king of Babylon and slain before his eyes, all of which prediction was fulfilled in good time. We need to keep in mind that the admonitions and the prophecies that are given us through the spirit of prophecy will be fulfilled in good time. We are not to set aside the spirit of prophecy thinking that just because it was said <clears throat> 115 years ago when Future for America pushed this to the forefront of the national and world conscience, that this will never occur. This prediction will be fulfilled in good time. Other false prophets arose to sow confusion among the people by turning them away from obeying the divine, divine commands given through Jeremiah. But God's judgments were pronounced against them in consequence of their grievous sin of bringing rebellion against him. If we are not willing to consider the chronology, if we are not willing to consider the symbols, if we are not willing to consider the messages, are we not rebelling against God? This is a thought that I think we each need to consider more completely. Now, I'm going to scroll down because there's some things I would like for us to consider in the time we have remaining. This was a very large document. Uh, just a little bit. So this is actually the laying of the cornerstone for the the Capitol, Correct. Um, not the Capitol building. Um, so I'm not quite sure I understand all this. Now, there the, the, was a ceremony on September 18th, 1893, um, that was basically a Masonic ceremony. Right. Um, it's kind of interesting. The biblical date was the sixth day of the sixth month. Okay. So, so I guess, um, so the United States Capitol or the Capitol building, I guess it's part of the same thing. So, so they made this building to become the Capitol. Correct. And then everything's sort of centered around that. The city sort of built around this this building that they built correct that okay okay so i think i understand um if you get if you get a good aerial view you will find that pretty much all of the roads lead to that capital okay okay washington dc is a it, i mean it it Unless you've been there, you would not understand how strangely, truly strangely laid out it is. Okay. The only other city in America that I've ever been in that says as strangely laid out as it is Portland, Oregon. I cannot figure out my way around Portland. I have to have some way of being directed. That's just me. Now, in 1891, Apparently, Mrs. White sent a telegram. 
When former rain came, devout men of all nations there, Isaiah 66, 18 and 19. For I know their works and their thoughts. It shall come that I will gather all nations and tongues and they shall come and see my glory. And I will set a sign among them and I will send those that escape of them unto the nations to Tarshish, to Pol, to Lud, that draw the bow, to Tubal and Javan, to the isles far off, that have not heard my fame, neither have seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. Chicago Fair dedicated May 14th. Greatest number of devout men present. Their sacred year began April 16th. First month closes May 16th. Last, Joel 2, 23. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. People asleep. For the love of Jesus, Joel 1, 14, Zephaniah 2, 1 to 3. Why are these verses being compared one to another? Joel 1, 14, sanctify ye a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry unto the Lord. Gather yourselves together, yea, gather together, O nation not desired. Gather yourselves together, yea, gather together, O movement not desired. Before the decree bring forth, before the day passes the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. Seek ye the Lord, that all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment, seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Answer good or bad quick. And this is found in EA 85.2. Apparently, this was a telegram sent by Mrs. White, because I believe EA is experiences in, our, in Australia. My question for your consideration, why would she be comparing Joel 114 with Zephaniah 2, 1 to 3? What point is she trying to drive home to us today? What message is being given here? Well, I mean, this is the message to call us together. Right? Right. And, and basically for repentance of our sins. This is the upper room. It is, it is most indeed the upper room. It is also, is it not, the message that we are to understand so that we can properly give it to the world? Mm -hmm. But we need a character, too. Agreed. I mean, in some ways, the character is the message. All right. If we have not the character, we cannot give a message. Formerly, in 1888, was a character established to give a message? No. What happened after 1888? 
did not the church choose to separate or cast out Jones, Wagner, and Mrs. White, sending Mrs. White to Australia where there was no leading from our Heavenly Father, sending Wagner to England, leaving Jones alone. Yeah, and sending Wagner to England was bad because Wagner got involved in pantheism while in England. It was very stylish at the time. And through whose influence did he become involved in pantheism? Well, through Kellogg. Wasn't it also through Conradi? Yeah. Yeah. Conradi as well. I mean, they were all kind of, I guess, influencing each other. I'm not sure where it started. Well, the seeds came from Kellogg. Okay. But the watering and the growth of the plant was because of Conradi. Hmm. Mrs. White, it, it's not noted that she sent a lot of telegrams. And the only reason I can say this, in answer to this telegram and letters that followed, letters were sent to Brother Caldwell and Brother Stanton. Review articles were prepared. These were reprinted in testimonies to ministers 32 to 62, according to W.C. White. But I found the reference here to the Chicago Fair dedicated May 14th to be interesting. Now, we've addressed a number of points today, but we have not had a lot of direct input and conversation. I recognize that these are difficult things to have to consider. What is standing out to each one today? What do we see with what we've covered? One of the warnings that sure stands out to me is to conduct myself in a manner that would lead souls to Christ instead of re repelling them. I feel very responsible because she said that no soul goes down to hell basically without dragging others with it. And that is very convicting and a very sober warning. I would agree. Anyone else? We, we typically don't think of it that way. And it really is all eye opening. It's a lot for us to consider, isn't it? Yeah, so this is this it's is hard to pray about. Okay, so this is rather interesting. Um, so so in this manuscript that we have here, um, this is Ellen White's experiences in Australia. So she's in Australia. Mm -hmm. And she's going to write this letter. Um, or is this? So let me see here. So she's in Caldwell, Sydney. That's the name of the place she's in. I would assume so. I'm, I, I'm trying I, to figure this out. Because it's Ellen White, Banks, Terrence, Wellington. Uh, let me see. I'm trying to figure this out. I'm just because I'm looking at it online and trying to figure out how this is. Um, okay, so that's another letter. So she. So this is basically when former rain came, devout men of all all nations there. Isaiah 66, 18, 19. Chicago Fair dedicated May 14. Greatest number of devout men present. Their sacred year began April 16. First month closes May 16. Last Joel 2.23. People asleep for the love of Jesus. Joel 1.14. Zephaniah 2. 1 to 3. Answer good or bad quick. So 
I mean, it's it's kind of a, a very cryptic sort of uh, telegram, was it? A telegram? Correct. So what is she saying about this um, this World Fair? Is she talking about the Sunday Law issue? Um, devout men of all nations there? Hmm. That it would have been an opportunity to present a message, that it was a message that the church itself did not wish to see go out. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the whole reason that they stood in opposition to this was because as Mrs. White, Jones, and Wagner presented this message after the 1888 General Conference session, the church became worried that this was going to affect the cash flow, the money coming into the church. Because as you read deeply into the record, that they didn't have to speak about tithes. They didn't have to speak about offering. They didn't have to mention money in any of their discourses, mm -hmm. but great amounts flowed in the church wanted to have control of the money they wanted to have control so that they would think that hey you know we're doing this for god rather than giving praise that this was occurring so that further work could be done they became worried for their own position mm -hmm. I see a 2023 there. The 2? 23? Yes, Joel 223. Yeah, I see it as 2023. Mm -hmm. Interesting, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So, um, Dwight. Yes. Now, you know that note you sent out to me and I asked for um, entitled notes for 9-17-22, you know, where you had the manuscript release 146-1899 through yeah. 148. And so, um, first of all, I can't find that anywhere um, in the DG White published stuff. So is this part of the unpublished documentations? I believe I seen a notice on the top of it said previously unpublished. Right. October 7th, 1899, Sunnyside, Quorum Bang, New South Wales, Australia. So where, where did you get this from? Everything that I'm using right now comes off from the Ellen White website. Really? I can't have it. So I guess uh, I'm having the same problem that um, Theodore is having, not being able to pull it out because I, I've used the the um, legacy site and the and the new site, and I've done a search on MS 146 18, 1899, and it produces nothing from either site. Okay, I'll, what I'll do after the meeting today, I'll make sure that the link for manuscript 146, 147, and 148 are sent out along with the copies of what Wait I sent. What did I? Yeah, that was the right number. Okay. Uh, and there was another thing, this, the notes that you've been using today. Yes. Um, this uh, telegraph issue. Mm -hmm. um, can you send that? Yeah. I appreciate it. I'd like to look at that a little closer. Okay. I'd like to have it, Dwight, if you don't mind. No I, I get a little frustrated because I can't, like, you know, 
turn the page back because you, you roll through the thing and I'm trying to look through back to, you know, I don't read quite oh. that fast, but <laughs> Hey, come on. I'm doing the best I can with one eye. <laughs> I'm trying to do anything with both eyes. <laughs> okay. okay. So I appreciate that. If you you would. We'll make, I'll, I'll make sure that these, you know, these links and these notes go because um, I mean, I'm what I, what I just did, I found interesting. I'm, I've got to do a quick analysis before it becomes firm, but it looks as if like with the, the term criticizing others, right. according, according to the Ellen White website, there were 46 documents where she used that phrase. Yet when I'm looking at this a little closer, I believe there's only 23 documents that they've repeated this a couple of different ways in a couple of different times. Now, 46 is interesting to me because that's the number of chromosomes in the human body. 46 is also interesting because that's 1798 to 1844. 23 is interesting because that's the number of half the chromosomes of a human body, but we're talking about whether it's from the mother or from the father. So the notes that I used earlier, I'll make sure that this, this comes. Um, if I have your email address, You'll get it from me. You may also see it a second time from theater. Any other thoughts right now? Any other questions? Okay. Our time today is at a close. Shall we close in prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, in the time that we have spent together, we have considered many words of your prophet. We have considered the task that must be before us. We have also considered, Father, and are beginning to consider more, that we need to examine ourselves ever more fully. This is a distasteful task. We ask, Father, for your spirit, for your guidance and your direction. Help us to consider what we need to understand about ourselves so that we may be more prepared for the message that you would seek to have given to this world. I thank you for each one that has participated today, for each one that has attended today, for the guidance and the blessing that you are giving us in examining these messages. Be with us now. Direct us, please. Through this Sabbath, may we each have a Sabbath blessing and be more prepared for that which you would have us to consider. For this we ask, for this we pray, in Jesus' name, amen.